Dealing with resistance is Andrew's meaty subject and demonstrating for Andrew today are Sarah Wood, Beck Watson and Lyndall Bent. Sarah Wood is a pharmacy technician located in Samford. Gerard Bry Amelia is Sarah's first real dressage horse and is extra special as her mum bred her and gave her to Sarah as a wedding present. After Amelia fractured her leg in 2010, they had a lot of time out from competing, so Sarah is really pleased to be out competing at elementary level this year and hopefully having an injury-free season. Gerard Bry Amelia is a nine-year-old, 16 one-hand warm blood mare by Archimedes. Sarah is coached by Anjanette Harton and is sponsored by her husband, Blaine Woods. She hopes one day to compete at Grand Prix level. Beck Watson is a production manager in the family business. From Thornlands and returning to riding after a long break, Beck is riding Starcrossed, an eight-year-old 14 one-hand pony of unknown breeding. Beck and Starcrossed compete at pre-St George level and are coached by Anjanette Harton, Brett Parbury, and Warwick and Linus McLean. Lyndall Binch is an engineer and IT professional in the race resources industry. Located in Greenbank, Lyndall has been riding since the age of two and has competed in eventing to three star level, been a member of the Queensland Eventing Squad and won the Queensland Event Horse of the Year. Today, Lyndall is riding First Dance, a 16 three hand six year old gelding by First Kiss. He was bred by Kenlock Park Stud in Victoria and Lyndall purchased him two years ago. They are currently competing Novice Elementary and this combination are coached by Ricky McMillan, Anne Jeanette Harton and Bet Brett Parbury. I'll hand you over to Andrew. Thank you very much. It's a big pleasure to be here and um, sometimes when you do these impromptu demonstrations, it can be a bit risky um, because you don't always know what you've got. I feel pretty comfortable because um, these uh, riders are all trained by Anne Jeanette Harton and I am very understanding and clear in what she does. And the other good thing that I'm finding just by sheer luck is that, um, maybe it's not that much luck, is that we've got three different problems. Uh, one's more of a stop problem, one's more of a go problem, and one is a, uh, basically a turn problem. And I'll explain about that because when I look at behavior problems, I always delve down into the basics and get the horse back to kindergarten, you know, like taking him back to primary school and look at all of his basics and go back and retrain them one by one because I've never yet in all of my work in teaching in 12 different countries seen a horse with a behaviour problem of any sort, even if it's just mild tension, where it gets 10 out of 10 in all of its basics. So the first horse I will take on will be Lindell. And um, so if I can just ask the other two, Beck and Sarah, to just maybe remain down the other end and just chill out, have a little walk around. That's all good. And just before I start, one thing I wanted to tell you about is I was very fortunate this year, um, I won a fellowship to the United States from the US government to the national by the National Sporting Library. And I spent all of June in Virginia living at the National Sporting Library. And there, there is the biggest repository of old classical texts. And I wanted to delve into these texts. It's been a hobby of mine so that I could find out what classical writing was all about, going right back to the earliest treatise by Grizzoni in 1559. And basically what he, he explained, and then Pluvenel and people like that afterwards, they basically were all on the same kind of page, saying that the walk is the mother of all the gates. The walk is the gate where you can train the horse to be obedient, so it's the gate for obedience. If you get obedience at the walk, you get it at the trot. And then the trot is the gate for suppleness. This was Pluvenel's idea, who was the French trainer. So I like to begin in the walk and just get all the nuts and bolts working quite well. So that's why we come back to the walk. Um, all of these basic things that we're doing, I'm looking at really how the horse stops, how it goes, how it turns its forelegs, and how he turns his hind legs. So it sounds pretty simple, but within stop, I've got a number of things I can do. I can see not only how does he come down one gate, but also how does he slow within the gate and can we vary that? Can we go quite slow? 
and all this from basically a rain aid. I'm talking rain and leg aids, by the way, and not seat aids, but I'm not denying the seat. I'm saying go with the flow with the seat, but don't influence him so he's only hearing one signal. And when all the problems are sorted, go back to the seat. It'll be, al it'll be already installed. Um, it all relies on the basic stop. So, Lindell's horse tends to um, be, get, get tense at times. He's, he can buck. And he hasn't ever got her off, she told me this morning, which is nice, so I hope it doesn't happen here. But for me, the essential part of that is the stop button. We've got to teach him to stop because unless you plan on going to long reach and riding in the rodeo, you're not going to be able to sit on it in a dressage saddle. And so don't let them do it. Teach them that when they're with people, on the lunge, under saddle, in hand, they do not buck. And that is just a matter of decelerating, you know, stopping. So, we'll be delving into the stop more with him. Another horse will be delving more into the go. So let's look, have a look, just basically, how he does stop. And I want you to tell me what you feel there, um, Lindell, when, when he stops. And how does that feel in your hand? A little bit heavy or and a bit leaning there? It started off all right and then it got a bit heavy. What I want you to understand is that from the point of view of the horse's psychology, if the horse leans on the bit, you've got to remember for him, that is meant to be a signal for decelerating, for slowing and stopping. So if he leans on it, he should do something that we've trained. For example, if, if we lean on the stop, we want him to stop, or if we lean on it when he stops, we go a li little increase in pressure, we want him to step back, because that's the mother of rain back. Remember, it's called rain back, because it began with the reins on the young horse, and it might turn into other aids later, but it begins there. So what I want him to learn is that when he leans on the bit, we need to do something like decelerate and, gear and step back and then give, just one step. If you do too many steps, it makes it uh, worse. So if he's leaning now, if you feel him increase the pressure, just do one step back, just one step back. Good, and that's enough. And you'll get the second step for free, because if he does a big enough step, obviously the other leg will come back too. And so that's a good way of gauging, was it big enough? The other thing that you can do is if you know one leg is more in front than the other, for example, his right front is more in front at the moment, that will probably be the, the leg that will come back. And so if you ask him to step back now, use your right rein just a little bit more. Good, and release. That's it. And now when you ride him forward now in the walk, when you hold him, if you feel any slight increase in the rain pressure, just do a little step back during the increase. So that in the end, the horse and give. Well done, very good. That's good, good boy. And so when you feel he starts to get light, as soon as he does his first light reaction, you know, you go stop and it's perfect. So do it again. Good, and if, it's, if you're happy with it, say good boy and give him a scratch. Now you say good boy during the moment he gives the right reaction, because good boy should be a signal, it's not just something you do white noise and talk to him about, you need to teach him that that's a signal that he's done well and here comes something good, especially something like scratching. So I would actually rub him at the wither, not pat him, because patting makes no difference to horses, we know that, there's heaps of studies showing how ineffective it is, but because we're primates we always pat. You know, chimps pat each other on the head, but it really doesn't make any difference to a horse. Um, so do ask him to halt again, step him back if he's remotely heavy, from your left rein mostly, because his left front leg's in front, and give. Good, good boy. That's it. And it's a good idea to really go crazy with this positive reinforcement. Say, good boy, and give him a scratch, because that's the rapport, that's the rapport side of things. Okay, and then again. Ah, good boy. Okay, so I'm just showing you what we do. If this were a proper lesson, we'd be doing more and being a bit more sure. I'd like to get at least three repetitions that are good in a row, but we've done that. So the next thing I want to do is have a look at another gate element, and that is going up two gates, say from halt to trot, and then from trot to halt. So let's see how he is on the go button as well as the stop button. So, and go. That's it, so often when the stop has got a little hole in it, the go has two, 
And then now back to hold. One, two, three. Good. So one thing I would like to also mention is that when we do our transitions up one gate, we want them done in two beats of the front legs, if you count the steps. So by the time you see, as the audience, step three of the front legs, the horse and the horse goes into walk, the third step should be the correct walk. And by the same token, when you halt, the third beat should be zero. And that puts the transitions into a habit format, because like in martial arts or ballet, you know, you have to do things exactly the same way to form a habit. If it's random, it doesn't form anything. It just needs telling every single day of his life. Okay, so a squeeze him on. Good. And in, in the trot halt, we want that now not in two beats, but four beats, because we're going down two gates, not just one gate. So it's two beats per gate. So when you're ready, back to halt. One, two, three. Excellent, good boy. Now, Anjanette's trained him, so he's already doing it well. So on the young horse, I want him to do it in four beats. Now, he, he's elementary, isn't he? Is he heading that way? Yeah. So on the in the elementary horse, we would like it to come down in maybe three beats. And in the horse that's advanced and above, we want even the trot halt to happen in two beats. I'll just explain a little bit there, because when you get it in four beats on the young horse, that creates smoothness because that's the rhythm. And he goes, and one, two, three, four. It's like music. When it's in three beats, it creates smoothness and squareness. And so he goes, one, two, three, and he's halting square because there's no more um, walk steps left in there. He's just trotting into his halt. And when it's in two beats in the horse that's advanced and above, it creates squareness, smoothness, and throughness. And the first time you see throughness on a horse, this is the old French and German definition of throughness. The definition is, uh, definition is when the rein aids, that is the reins, when the rein aids flow through to the back legs. So when the horse is through, his back hooves come one hoof print closer to the front legs. So let's have a look. Now when you go into the trot, make him jump into the trot. That's it. So the first hoof that hits the ground gets trotting. And then you count the steps when you use the rein. And on a straight line, good boy, well done, that's good. Now that was in three, and he was square, but he put his right leg back, and that doesn't matter, but the f uh, because he's also a little closer. So when the horse is through in the halt, he should be carrying his hooves under his stifles. In the young horse, he carries it behind, he, you know, he's out behind a little bit, and that's okay, that's, it's a developmental aspect, we don't expect him to do it immediately, okay? And when you say go, he's got to jump. Good, well done. And then when you're ready, back to halt. Good boy, well done. Now that's through and square and smooth, but he stepped back. So what you've got to do there is think, ah, I should have actually softened my rein pressure because he thought I meant to step back. Try one more time. And woo. Good boy, okay, They're not quite as good, but not bad either. Now just have a little walk, and I'll just explain that. So the, um, when we go from halt to trot, you know, I was saying when we go from trot to halt, going down two gates, we expect it in four beats. The reason for that is, in the beginning, in the young horse, is the muscles for stopping are the front end muscles, not the back end. The horse principally stops and goes backwards with the chest muscles, the pectorals mostly, they're, and they're small muscles. If you dissected the horse, you could put each of them in a bucket on each side of his chest. But the go muscles are way, way stronger. So while you can only expect the young horse to halt from trot in four beats, unless you do damage, you can expect the young horse to go halt to trot in two. Like in other words, he can really jump into f his uh, hoof print. So you want one hind foot to jump into the foreprint of the other. Now that's, these transitions are really important for the bucker. I'll tell you why. You might wonder well, why you're doing this. Sounds more like dressage than fixing problems, but it isn't. What we're teaching him, the big transitions of trot to halt, if he was really difficult, I'd even do canter to halt, but I would want that in six steps, because I'm going down three gates. Two beats per gate. Um, 
why it's so good is because if you can use your reins every time the horse goes to buck, you've got control. He doesn't continue on. You think of how many times you got bucked off, all of you in this stadium, I know I have, and you used the reins and the horse just grabbed a bit and ran through them. And you think, that's a bit of a bastard of a horse. But actually, he just doesn't stop. He's just, when he feels the rain aid, he hasn't got a learned response of stopping. So you've got to train it. And these trot halts really dig deep into that. I much prefer this because if you, even though many people like to use one rain stops, there's a problem of crookedness that develops from one rain stops in the dressage horse and the jumping horse when you start bending their neck around from a rain aid. You're really stuck then to get him truly straight in challenging circumstances. Okay. Now, the other thing that I thought I might mention, I'm just going to try and do 15 minutes per person, and I'm nearly, nearly up. But the other thing that I thought I might mention is when he halts, I was trying to look to see which is his dominant leg, because one diagonal pair will usually be resistant to rain aids. And I looked at him out there when he was trotting around, I couldn't really see it very clear. Um, it's usually the right front and left hind, but I had a slight feeling out there, it was his left front and right hind, only because if you just, just halt him anyway and just see, we'll see, because he's mostly square, but if you watch, when most horses don't halt very square, they'll typically halt with one leg in front of the other, and the one in front's his running leg. That's the leg that is heavier in the rein on the same side. That's the leg that, that when you slow him, um, stops the progress of short steps and slow steps and everything because he just gets, uh, that's his weakest link of slowing. So you always try and t determine which is the running leg. And if that were the case, I would have said to Lindell, when you do your trot halt with your left rein, vibrate your left rein a little bit more, and especially try and catch it in the swing phase, like when it's in the end, go woo, so that it comes back to halt. Because a halt, if you think of the mechanics of it, it's a, a linear reduction in tempo. In other words, it goes and one, too, like a sheet of music, but it's an exponential drop in, in, in length because the first step of halt, so this is the stride length if you see my legs, and then the first step of halt comes to be only this long with his left front, but that's still from here to here, and the next step's way shorter, it's only this one, and that's the one you try and target in the horse that's heavy on the right rein, and that's the one you've got to fix if he runs and bucks and does anything. And the more transitions you do, the better the horse is. So that's, um, I think that probably will do uh, for you because I'd hate to be finishing up not giving the other a chance, but thank you very much. Yeah, you've done a good job too because I like the way he holds so, so square in his front legs. So I like to get the, I can, we can definitely create squareness in the halt with our reins and when we stop with the young horse and go one, two, then it shrinks back to seat aids, like it becomes invisible. So I'm not, I often get misunderstood and misquoted where people think I'm just all about pulling and kicking. I'm not at all, I'm about shrinking it to be invisible so that in the end, you can't see it, it's just really, you get the feeling that your seat goes and one, two. Okay, I think we'll have Sarah next. Now, Sarah, Sarah's horse, is, you know, like a lot of modern horses, quite sensitive and tends to shy and spook and do things like that. So what I want to explain first of all, there's a couple of things that happen. Horses th that are too round will shy and spook more than ones that aren't. There's more shyers in dressage than any other sport, so that tells you something. And it's not just the breed of the horse. It's also because of two things. When, when their nose is behind the vertical and they're too deep, which is not a bad place to ride them, I'm not saying it's bad to ride them long and low and down, but if they're like that all the time, then they can't see above. Because the horse doesn't have a circular uh, retina like we do, he has a visual strip. And this strip enables him to see all of the horizon, but nothing above and nothing below, pretty much. And so when he's too round, he can't see. So if he's never seen the environment, suddenly he sees the flowers and goes, boom, flowers. So that's one thing. We try and let him see the world when his head's up. And also when they get a shut gullet, there's a lot of evidence to suggest that that increases their tendency to shine because of anoxia. 
Um, so what we're going to do is let's analyze what shying is or spooking. It's a loss of tempo and a loss of line. So the line thing's really, really big. So first of all, I'll deal with the loss of line in a minute, but let's have a look at tempo. Tempo to me is the old understanding of what rhythm is, and that is it's simply that the horse keeps on doing what you wanted it to do. Um, I think Nicole Tuff showed it really nicely this morning that when she showed that when you release the reins for self-carriage, the horse should stay in his speed. And so maybe just check that and say, give your rein away and see if he, see if he runs off. I don't think he's going to. No, that's good. He should not only stay in his speed, he should stay in his line and his carriage. So let's have a look at how he stops first of all because we don't want to have a brake issue. Good. Okay, and then go. And then, now Sarah, if I can get you, just try not to do any fiddling because look, we all get, we tend to get so fussed about roundness. We go, da -da -da -da, but just don't play any little game with your fingers. Just try and follow his mouth wherever it is because when you fix behaviour problems, you go back to kindergarten, you want them to be nice and long and you're going back and sorting out where their problem is. Yeah, that's it. So just now have a contact. So feel his lips. So you've got a, you know, quite a, um, a connection there, but just follow with both hands evenly, backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards. That's it. And then when you ask him to stop, what you're going to be doing is like increasing the closing of your fingers and going, and woo, woo, good boy. That's it. And is he a little heavy there? Yeah, okay. Well, if he's heavy... We'll do, I want you to do like I did with the other horse, do a little step back if he's heavy, just to get rid of that. Because the more you do this, the more you can make it that their lives just, they don't practice heavy anymore. This is really getting deep into the problem. Check, first of all, can you step back? Yep, I can then again. And give. Just do one step and give. Good. And so it's big enough that he does the other step as well for free. So back again. Good, okay, so he's a left front leg runner, this horse, isn't he? Because the right leg says, no problem, I'm really good at this, and the left leg says, I don't like doing this at all. So you, here you've got the perfect opportunity, you've got the left leg in front. With your left rein more th than your right, go backwards again. So left rein, back, good. There's many telltale signs that he's like that. You know, when he goes back, he not only does a short one with his left front leg, he also draws lines in the sand. The more you even up the young horse, the more he'll be even in the later stages of his life. So back again, more left rein, left, and give with the right. Well done. Good. And then again. Good boy. And then make a big deal if it's light. If it's good, make a big deal. So good boy. Good boy. Yeah, really make it. See, he appreciates that. Yeah, he loves it. They're really contact animals. This is attachment theory. This is how you develop the rapport. It's not with patting. It's with scratching. Okay, now we'll walk him forward. And when you're ready, if it, when you hold him, do a step back. And during the halt, if he's heavy at all, like not even pausing afterwards, stop immediately if he's heavy in the halt. And you'll only need to do this. Oh, that was okay. <laughs> Good boy. Sometimes just the step backs help that. What I was going to say, if he was heavy, you usually would only need to do three or four and it will be solved on that day. It's not a long-term thing. And then tomorrow you might need to do one or two. And then they start to stay light as long as you, you, know, you keep it polished. Okay, happy enough with that. Let's say we've got stop and go. Now I'll look at line. Now, we've got two reins in our hands. So we can open our rein and do a direct turn. So maybe turn towards me by opening your right rein. So this is a basic turn. This is no leg. This is just purely reins. You're getting steering. This really makes a difference to a horse that shies. Good. Left turn. Now right. So that was right turn. Now left turn and turn. Good. So what I'd like you to do is maybe ride up the center line or the quarter line, three quarter line, and ride a wiggly line, just a little bit turn right with your right rein and a little bit turn left with your left rein. Good, and a little bit turn right with your right rein. Good, and keep doing it till you get to the center and then come back. And the ideal time to use the rein, see there's three ways a horse can turn, and one's right and two are wrong. The right 
correct, the correct movement for a horse in training turn at the walk is that he opens his foreleg and then closes the other leg. So he goes open, close, open, close, like a pirouette. That's a, a, quite a steep turn. So you try and stimulate the rein aid during the swing phase because reins don't work on stance phases. When the horse's feet are on the ground propelling, they don't listen to anything. They're busy holding 600 kilograms from falling flat on its face. So you always work on swing phases. So you go open at the right moment. So to turn right, it's like now or now, and then turn left. And you go left turn now or now. So he gets a little bit of opening. Good. Okay. Right. So that's your direct turn. Your indirect turn is the closing rein on the neck. Now this is the one where I was really pleased that the British Horse Society gave me the chance to show how important it is uh, a couple of years ago and I did the same in Germany because the indirect turn never went to Germany it stayed in France and Italy and Spain but it's really useful because everyone does it you know it's inside leg to outside rein the diff the, the, the basic elements of inside leg to outside rein is riding the horse forward and straight in other words you push the horse with your inside rein on inside leg on a circle and your outside rein can keep him on that line. If your outside rein doesn't, it's because he doesn't know what the outside rein should do. And that's the indirect turn. So we can teach him that. So what I'd like to do is maybe let go of your left rein. Now he, he does know a left an indirect turn because I, I asked Anjanette and I asked you, so you can just show us. So without any left rein at all, with your right rein push so he turns right. That's it. Let go of the left even more if you can. So let go of your left rein. Yeah, loop it so we can really see that when you push your right. Good. Right. The beauty of this turn is that it actually is really good for therapy. It's good for horses that fall in, fall out. You close the rein. I don't find at all that it's useful to use your leg because your leg's your go button. And if you stop him falling out with your leg, you may quicken him and you may get him back through leg yielding but it's not the fault, the fault's in the front legs and that's your steering, the horse steers from the front end. So you try and give the horse equal number of jobs from your rein aids and your leg aids. So your reins stop, slow, shorten and turn and your legs go up the gate faster, a lengthen and yield. So what about the other way? Can you make him push out with your left rein? Good. So these are our basics for our turn. Why am I doing this? Because when a horse shies, He's doing a random turn you never asked for. What makes a horse shy more one way than the other? Because it's his weakest turn that he knows so little of. So you try and teach him to have even turns. And there's always one turn that's worse. So now we can use it for therapy. Let's do it. So what I want you to do is use his ears like gun sights. Look straight through his ears and maybe have a landmark. Say it's B and ride him to B and have him really soft in the rain, softer than normal, so that he can make mistakes. And when he does, use your indirect turn to bring his front legs back on your line. Like if you feel him drift right, close your right rein and put him back on your line, then release. And then find another landmark and do that. This, it's so important because it's teaching the horse also to go on your line in self-carriage. You know, I I, it's wrong, it's not, correct in training to hold the horse on your line. You want the horse to hold himself on his line in his own brain because that's training. It's not training if you're holding him. It's called wrestling. Okay. And now on the next line, so he's pretty much okay there, isn't he? He's done a bit of drifting. You've helped him a bit. Which way is he drifting mostly towards are you finding? Which way is he drifting mostly? To the left? Yeah, because his left is le a left front leg runner, you see. So the when a horse has a running leg, like one leg they're heavier on, they not only run through your hand, but they also do a lot of falling out. So most horses are right front leg runners, as I mentioned. They'll fall out right. They're heavy on the right side, hollow on the left. So the next thing we would do, and this is the last one, is we would deepen his direct turn now and give him slightly challenging circumstances by riding him along the wall 
And say if we ride him on the right rein, with our left rein, we open it and we pull his front leg to the, to the, to the, closer to the wall. Don't let him step over it. It's better in an indoor with big sides. And get him closer than he would normally be. Good. And open. And open. That's it. Good. That's it. So it's not about doing sh shoulder in. Some of you might remember I used to do ride horses in behaviour clinics all through the 90s and in 2000 and whatever, riding horses that uh, shy. And in the early days, I just did shoulder in because that's what the book said, and I never really fixed a horse. I kept seeing them next time saying, no, he still shies. And that's because, you see, the, the basic turn is a direct turn. You can, you can really make him get to the side with a direct turn. You can get him there. And you see, when the horse tends to shy, what he tends to do is just lose his line. He keeps choosing it. You know, you'll ride him down the line and the shying horse just says, oh no, I don't like flowers and I don't do E and I definitely don't like speakers. And so it makes him swerve away. And so then he becomes controlled by the environment and not by your aids. And that's the place you do not want to be. Good boy, well done. So when he's really good and he goes back on a light aid, give him, make a big deal, make it really nice. Good, they're nice ears he's got. He's looking happy. So all this is when he's not round. When you've got it done when he's not round, then you can make him do it again later when he's rounder. But before you do, the next thing I would do is test, can you keep him to the side with your indirect turn? So with your right rein, can you keep his shoulders to the left, closer to the wall? So basically the horse, horses choose to walk about, you know, 10 inches to one foot away from the wall and you're saying, go closer. You'll be amazed if you see a shying horse. He just will not want to do it. So you just take it carefully and you say, yeah, closer and closer and closer. And if he shows a big spook about something, he's not. He's being really good. Um, but if he did and he just doesn't want to go there, it's best not to force him and, you know, get up him with the stick because if you do, you're adding more adrenaline to the whole story. Just stand still and wait for about 15 to 20 seconds and he may just decide to go by himself because there's some interesting studies now that show this, that it takes about 15 seconds on average for arousal levels to change to investigative behaviour. In other words, they want to investigate it because it didn't move and it didn't attack them. So you just stay put and oftentimes he will just walk there himself. And the last thing that you would do along the wall, just to check the, for the shying, so we've done direct turn towards the wall, we've basically pulled his legs towards the wall, we do it in both directions, then we do indirect, which is what you've just done, and the last thing is we get him to yield along the wall, it's like a leg yield. So it'll look like a shoulder in, but it's a leg yield, and we say, can you put your backside to the wall? Good, all the way along the wall, that's it, or even through the corner, say, will you put your hind feet there? And you see, it's really just about getting control, that's all. So it begins to make you wonder, do horses really shy at things or do they just tell you that the rider has no control? That's it, good boy, that's it, well done. And good with your reins, well done, very good, happy with that, very nice. And then the other way. Good. Well done. So we do this all around the arena. We don't need to because we're just showing you. So come back and go along the wall again and now just do the same thing in the other direction. So change rein. We're on the left, uh, sorry, right rein now. And again, hind quarters to the wall. So we're leg yielding along the wall. and then we'll put the front end to the wall later. Good boy, that's it, yeah, good, that's it. So once you've done the front end, the back end will do it. When we're doing this front end to the wall, by the way, I didn't get a chance to show you because he's already had some training in this, but w what they do when they resist going to the sides and they see flowers, for example, they don't like flowers for some reason, perhaps, he might do a big swerve there and then you get him back and you come and you repeat it and you give him a bit more pressure. You go, no, come on, you've got to do it. Put your foot there. And when he does, his, his hindquarters will spin out. Don't put them back. 
They're just slaves to the front end. The forelegs tell the hind legs what to do. There's a cluster of nerves in the spine called a central pattern generator that um, we've known in cell biology for a long, long time now. And in all quadrupeds, the front legs tell the back legs what to do, what gait to do. If the front, right front's trotting, it says back legs trot. It's easy to misunderstand that in dressage because in dressage we get the idea that the back legs do everything. But they are just the engine, that's all. It's definitely the engine for go, but all the decisions are made in the front. And so when a horse spins its hindquarters out, don't fix its hindquarters. Just imagine if its right hind pushed the bum to the left, it's probably likely that the, right, that the left front pushed the shoulders to the right. Okay. Anyway, he's showing this really well. I'm glad of that because we got three demos and I thought maybe um, we'll be like having to spend all our time with one, but uh, he's been very good because he, he hadn't been in this arena, had he? Uh, he's been in the arena, but in this arena with all the people and whatever? No, but in the arena, but not with people. Okay, well, that's good. Well done. Okay, so what I want to show you is that at the very basic level, you, I don't mind if you turn the horse with your upper thigh. It just seems like lunacy to me, and I've never heard it explained in any form of logic that you would turn the horse with your lower leg because that's your go button, and it's got a hell of a lot of jobs to do anyhow. So you can use your upper thigh, providing it works, but you have to always make sure your rein aids are polished. One of the things that uh, came to me really vividly was one of my pupils is a, doing a PhD and we got a whole lot of money from Riddick and we bought sensors under the saddle, a pad from Germany, and we invented some sensors under the rider's calves and heels so we could look at leg pressures and we had rain tensiometers to test the pressures of the reins. And when riders tell you that, oh no, I only use my seat, Actually, what the horse feels is something a little different because the seat pressures are very difficult to determine what you feel un underneath, what the horse feels underneath the saddle because don't forget, you got, you might feel clear with your seat, but you've got saddle leather, you've got tree, you've got air or flock, you've got a thick saddle pad and you've got a thick saddle cloth and that's when the horse has to read the signals. And now he can, but you just have to recognize how difficult it is. But what our studies have showed is every time a rider uses their seat aid for anything, there's always a spike in a rein aid for any downward transition, even if the rider doesn't think so, and there's always a spike in the leg aid that shows up on the graph on the computer. Other way. Okay, we better finish. Here comes Beck. That's my little word, I think, my, my call. Thank you very much, Lindell. Okay, now Beck's horse is one that has the opposite problem. He's a, he's, this horse is a pre-St. George pony, so it's, he's done well, but he tends to be behind the leg. So what I'll do, I'm going to cut to the chase. He's already warmed up quite a bit out the back and he's been walking about. So I'm going to take his spurs off because we're going to get him good off the leg. Okay. Right, okay, we've got these spurs off. Now, it doesn't mean you can't put him back on because you need to, because he's pre St. George, he needs spurs. But if we can get him going off leg aids, that would be better. So there's two ways of doing this. I'll show you both. When people have a lazy horse, they tend to just say with their leg, ah, push him up a bit, and then he goes flat again. It's better if you do something much more obvious to the horse, that the moment you feel, um, Beck, you want to use your leg aid, don't squeeze him quicker, make him trot. Go up one whole gate every single time. Good boy. Okay, and do half a circle or quarter and back to walk. That's it. And every time you feel you've got to help him, don't help him. Because every time you help him, it poisons the cue. It poisons the leg aid. Good boy. And that's true for any gait. If you're trotting, just give dressage away for the moment and just, if you're trotting, just say, right, we're cantering. Any moment, as soon as, but don't help him with your leg. 
the rule of training any animal is that you, you want to have just one signal for one response and not have to keep repeating it. You know, you don't want to have to keep saying to the dog, sit, um, sit, sit, sit. You don't want to have to say it that many times. You want him to be really sharp and just stay obedient. So that's one way. Okay. Because um, I'm running against time with the three of you in 45 minutes, let's, you understand that, don't you? That's a really good one to do. It's the same thing if the horse leans on the bit. If you're trotting, do a transition down to walk if it's really uh, persistent. If a problem's not persistent, by all means, do a half halt. But if the problem's persistent and he does it, do a, a change of gait up one gait for a go problem, down one gait for a stop problem. Good. Very good. And, and back. Good. Well done. Now, can I just have you... Are you right-handed? Good. And it's good because everyone can see your whip. This is the other method. Now... There's four steps to this method. I'll try and cover them. The first one is now halt him first of all. Just start with a halt. And what we're going to do is we're going to ride him like his legs, like Beck has no legs. Beck's not going to use her legs. She's just going to go with the whip, not whack him. Just tap him, tap, 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 with no gaps. Any gaps in the tapping will be rewarding the wrong response because a gap is a reward. So you, you keep the tapping rhythmic. You go da, 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 till he goes. Yeah. Now he doesn't have to trot yet. It's just really halt to walk. Halt to trot is the third step. So go halt and just enough tap that makes him walk. Good boy. And you keep doing this until he walks from just two taps, only two. So halt again. Tap tap. It'll soon come. Da, da, and you think, how the hell is this going to make the leg, leg aid better? Well, it does, because the leg aid's already installed. It's just got weaker. So he already knows about the leg. He's just not responding to it. So by using the whip only on its own and just tapping until he goes, it's, it sensitizes him to the leg. Okay. And now... Okay, now... The first step is going halt to walk, but anyway, you're already going halt to trot, so that's pretty cool, because that's the third step. So the first step's halt to walk, two taps. The second step's walk to trot, check that. Good, and need, you need to do that because, see the first step for him is an elevation, elevation, but not actually a thrust. Back to a trot, a walk, sorry. And keep doing this till he just Good, that's better. It's still weak, but it's better. Keep doing it. But you don't want him to do the hop. Good. So you just repeat this until he just thrusts into trot from two taps. Good. Back again. So it's all these little details. Good boy. That's it. Now, when he does it, as soon as he gives the right answer, say, good boy, and go nuts with your scratching. Now, really, you've got to dig deep into that scratching Good boy. Oh, that was a bit slack. And back again. So whenever you say good boy, always follow it up with a, with a scratch. Yep. Okay. And the third step, which is harder, you've already done it, is halt to trot. So just recapping. First step, halt to walk. Second phase, walk to trot. Third phase, halt to trot. And that's what we're doing now. Don't use your leg. Don't use your leg. That's it. Just your whip tap because it'll work much better. If you, if you, if you, when, it's not, when the cake is not cooked, if you use your leg, you're telling him that the leg aid's an okay aid to use when things are going badly. So you get him really sharp off your whip aid and you, your leg will definitely work on its own then. Good. And do, do, don't, no leg. Don't draw your heel up. That's it. Well done. Yeah, just keep your legs hanging there. Good, well done. Right, and the fourth stage is probably the best one. This is where you try and get him to increase his tempo from the whip, use a bigger amount of arena, just get him absolutely flying, and 
he may even end up lengthening from this. If you think you can lengthen him, uh, lengthen him. Just And you want that signal from the whip to be one tap because I like to make it different. Lengthening is one tap. So it's but tap him every third step. So you go tap, two, three, tap, two, three, and then stop the moment he goes longer. So tap him till, it, till you feel a change. Tap, tap. That's it. Good. And this is one of his little issues as a priest in George Horse. He's, he's a little weak on the bigger button. Yeah? Don't, don't slow down for this end. Just go, you know, just basically fang around like a child on a pony. That's it. Good. So this is just teaching him a basic attempt of how his legs should go when he lengthens. More, 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 more. Ask more. Ask more. Bigger. 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 And bigger. Yeah. It looks horrible. Don't worry. No one's looking. <laughs> Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Oh, no, no. And say, so, no, 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 canter. No, canter. Good boy. But now go again. Now go again. That's it. Right. Now the next part of that is you now you use your rain aid and say, a brief aid for shorter. You go now, woo, shorter. Good. And now use your whip tap again for longer again. And go. And you get that on the button so that you go, in, the, in a normal arena, you would go, um, a, say, on the long side, longer, and on the short side, shorter. And now longer. Tap. Good boy. And on the sh on, now, woo, shorter. And Focus on the downward transition because that gets judged just as much. You've got to really make him sink in two beats at the end of his length and strides. Now go. And bigger. Good. And now shorter. Woo. Good. And then now what's wrong with it? A few things. It's a little fast. How do we remove the speed? We remove the speed by slowing him. So we've already shortened him on the long side at the end. And now at A or C, we slow the trot. So, so you go shorter there, woo, shorter. And now here, now slower. Good boy. And then you bring into the long side and you say, now longer again. And you try and get that happening in two beats. Not quite, but that's, this is the program. And shorter there. Good. And at C, slower. Not too slow, but just slower. Good. And then at H, Longer again and longer. Good. Right. So th I don't want to find myself teaching a length and stride, but this is how I do it, and I find it always works. It's, it's quite successful this, this way. But um, what I'll get you to do now is no more whip. Now just see if you can get the same reactions from your leg. So when you get, so give him a nudge with your leg. With your, with your heel, make it different to just squeezing because that's faster, that's increased tempo, but your, a nudge from your heel is brief and it says, go longer, and that correlates with a shove of your seat. Good boy. And if it's not working that well, just go back and to the early parts. So I always say to people, when you give him the leg aid now on a lazy horse, do not give him a second aid if it didn't work go back and do five more repetitions of perhaps whip tap, halt to trot, or l longer strides, whatever you want to do, any of these four things, and then you'll find he'll be better on your leg and it will last for longer and you'll soon start getting out of the culture of lazy. Have a little walk. Just, some of you might know that the, my wife uh, trained uh, worldwide PB for the Olympics and PB was really very, bone lazy and all of Joe's work was with whip taps teaching him two taps on the rib cage for go uh, two little whip taps for go a bit quicker if he lost tempo two one whip tap for longer for length and strides and two taps on his chest for stop because her, she wasn't really very good with her arms because she was uh, had problems with her, her whole spinal co column being a, a grade 1b para rider and that horse got really bright to the whip taps it, it really is successful and he stayed uh, pretty bright and tends to stay pretty bright for some time. He does need reminding every now and again, but he is 20 odd years, old, years of age. Okay, one last thing to do now is I want to just show you because I haven't done any tempo work and this will be my last thing. Have, did I get the gong? No, yes, not yet. You, Andrew, yes, we are sort of running out of time. Oh, <laughs> give me just two minutes. Um, so I'll just show you in tempo, 
if you measure the tempo, I would like you to just trot. And the normal trot tempo is 75 beats a minute. I, I'm not actually texting, I have a metronome on my phone that um, I was going to use, but the, a good forward trot is, a, is roughly, when I say roughly, almost precisely 75 beats a minute. Now, if you go down the ranges of tempo, just with the rain aids, and you start to slow, you'll see that there's a certain, he starts to get a bit of cadence because he can't sustain a, the trotting gait if the horse just trots flat. He's going to have to start jumping from one leg to the other. So we'll see if we can get it. Okay, I'll get my metronome up, and I'll measure his outside front leg. So the normal trot tempo is 30. I'll try and put it on my... Um, you can hear that. Right, good. Cause that, now that's 70. Now smaller horses tend to go a bit quicker. That's already 72. So just see if you can slow it now and just go and whoa. Good boy, that's it. And as long as he stays trotting, so you try and work within the threshold of the trot he can do. It's very hard to get beyond 70 for any horse. But when they do, and at around 65, they start to show a little bit of lift. Good boy. And then push him forward because he says it's a little difficult. That's it. And just do little bursts of this. And slower. And the changes of tempo are really important. They're things we overlook because whenever the horse... Just try a little more. That's it. Good boy. Well done. Make a big deal of that. Okay. And I think... I think that probably will do because I'll be in trouble. Thank so. you, Andrew. Thank you Can very I much. Can I invite um, Anita Barton into the arena, please? We've got a little thank you for you, Andrew. Well done, thank you. And asking if you could possibly draw some raffle tickets for us as well. Um, hey, no worries, well done. Good little fella. Um, where is she? over there. Andrew, on the behalf of the 2014 Horseland Queensland Festival of Dressage, we would like to thank you very much for sharing your huge wealth of knowledge with us this afternoon. I'm sure everyone here has thoroughly enjoyed what you've had to say and has learned an awful lot. On behalf of the Festival of Dressage Committee, we would like to present you with this gift. A beautiful oh, framed picture. So very that's for nice. you to look at. That's your copy there. So thank you very oh. much, Andrew. We, we hugely appreciate it. Thank you very much. It's an, it's an absolute pleasure to come here. Thank you. I love this arena. I haven't been in this arena before. Last time I came for uh, this event, it was uh, Pine Lodge, but this is so Queensland, it's fantastic. <laughs> So uh, we'll just get you to present some raffles, please. We've got a few draws to do this afternoon, starting with the uh, giddy up socks and shirt. If you can present that for us. Right, okay. Okay, we've got green B49. Green B49. If you're not here, you can just come over to the raffle stand later if anyone knows who's got green B49. Our second prize is the Festival of Dressage merchandise pack. And that's orange D.